A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, two great organizations committed to cool people doing awesome things here in Montana. So the promotion doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that you have product market fit. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. All right, thanks for tuning in this week. Before we get into today's episode, I want to make a special announcement about First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. These two great local firms have agreed to sign on as presenting sponsors and supporters of A New Angle. That's just super exciting because it's going to help us improve the quality and the sustainability of the show. We launched this thing, I don't know, almost 10 months ago as kind of an underground shoestring operations. It was a side project I was recording in my office, and so many awesome things have happened since then for the show. I mean, amazing guests, and really the most amazing thing is all of you, all of you listeners, and we really appreciate the support you've given us. I mean, it's pretty easy to sit in a, in, a, in a room and record a podcast. I mean, all you gotta do is speak into a microphone and then click a few things and put it online. Um, what is difficult is to get people to listen. And the fact that all of you are listening is just a tribute to um, what we're doing and an interest in this community for positive stories about what's happening here at the University of Montana, but more broadly what's happening in in the state, across the state, with cool people doing awesome things. So thank you to all of you. And this partnership with First Security and Blackfoot is particularly compelling because these are two organizations deeply committed to development here in in our local economic ecosystem. They're supporting so many awesome things throughout the area, and the people in the organization are what bring them to life. I mean, in the last few weeks, you've heard from the CEO of Blackfoot, Jason Williams, and the VP of Innovation at Blackfoot, Joe Fungi. We did an episode with them a few weeks back. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Vice President and Director of Marketing at First Security, Jeff Petticord. And it was kind of through those two interviews and episodes that we started thinking about how those two organizations could help out and support and help um, help grow what we're doing here with the podcast. And in the weeks to come, we'll be getting more specific about what that partnership looks like and what it means for the show. But uh, we are excited to have these folks in in the fold, in the family, and um, just super excited about what this will do for the program. So thanks to First Security, thanks to Blackfoot, and thanks to all of you for um, making this thing go. So uh, we're going to turn it over to this week's episode. Super excited about this week's guest, Mario Schultzke. He's a self-described digital nomad with a house, um, but he's actually a lot more than that. I'll let you tell. I'll let him tell you what what that all means. But uh, Mario and I were colleagues here of a sort for five years. He worked with us in the marketing department, teaching marketing analytics, digital marketing, and bringing a lot of his industry knowledge and know how to uh, our students and just did a fantastic job in the classroom. Miss him as a colleague in many ways and hope we can entice him into teaching here again sometime in the future. Uh, Concurrent with that work, he also served as the Assistant Vice President of Communications here at UM and then the Vice President of Communications in his last couple of years here. He left the university in 2017 and uh, has some interesting thoughts about um, the challenges he faced uh, trying to do marketing for the University of Montana during a difficult time. And he has some great ideas for how we can move forward. And a lot of that uh, notion that he brings to the table centers around product, how we can build a great product here um, to innovate what we do here at the university. Mario is now the chief marketing officer at Genius Link. I'll let him tell you all about that company. And I just really respect the way this guy has curated his life, put together a set of experiences that has led him down a certain path. And now he's, he's kind of structured his life in such a way that um, it sounds pretty darn awesome. And uh, I'll let him sort of lay out uh, the decisions he made along the way to get there. Anyway, without further ado, I give you Mario Schultzke. 
All right, so here today with Mario Schultzke. Mario, thanks for coming on the pod. Hey, thanks for having me, Justin. I got to thank you. You've been a big supporter of this endeavor from the beginning, and it's really uh, great to finally have you on. I've been asking for a while. Yeah, yeah, you have. Thanks for having me. I I, I absolutely love podcasts as a um, medium, and I've loved your podcasts, and it's just it's just so cool that this is being produced right here in Missoula, Montana. There we go. Well, that Missoula, Montana place is maybe a great place to start. I mean, kid from Germany, come over here as an exchange student and just fill in the blanks there. I mean, you've been a part of this community in and out for a long period of time. So maybe by way of bio, just kind of lay it out there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm originally from Germany, right. uh, born and raised in Germany. Um, you know, I grew up with a, with a single mom who had very, uh, high ambitions for her little Mario and, uh, she decided um, at any given point to like try to get me into the best schools possible. Sure. Um, so I ended up going to a school that was way out of my league from just an intellectual perspective. And, so this uh, is a, like a high power high school in Germany. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a private Catholic high school. Um, I'm not Catholic. It was not like a, you didn't pay to go there, but it was pretty elite to get in. And and I think I was sort of their minority. Um, number. Uh, I was from out of town. <laughs> you filled your checks on box for them. Yeah, I was Protestant, and uh, um, but but boy, it was a tough school. Yeah. So I always just at some point, I would say in like seventh or eighth grade, I recognized that the only way I was going to make it through was by um, by leaving frequently. Mm. So I was kind of a professional exchange student. Um, I was in England in eighth grade. Uh, I was in France in ninth grade and France in 10th grade. And uh, the whole rationale was that whenever I come back, they really couldn't fail me because I'd missed, you know, one month, two months, three sure, months. Sure. And they'd blame it on the, you know, <laughs> French math teachers. And, um, and then in 11th grade, I decided to, to do the big one, which is a year in America. Uh huh. Um, was it down in Hamilton? Yeah, yeah. So this is nineteen. How the hell did Hamilton get on your radar screen from well, Germany? It didn't. Um, okay. I didn't even know what Montana was. Right. Uh, I didn't have an email address. I didn't have access to the internet at home. I don't think I'd ever been on the internet. And uh, like a week before I was supposed to leave, they're like, oh, yeah, you're, uh, you're going to Hamilton, Montana. And, um, you know, host family is um, uh, the dad is a soccer coach. Sure. And, uh, and that's how he had found me. Uh, apparently there were some articles online about oh, me playing yeah, soccer. You're a big time soccer player. Hamilton yeah. had never scored a goal or <laughs> won a game, and this was his strategy. So there was me and a like Czech kid and a French kid, but yeah, um, bringing this fancy German exchange student. But but the funny thing was that uh, when you know like a day before I came, uh, he found out that if I lived with him, I couldn't play for Hamilton because he actually lived in Victor. <laughs> And <laughs> you think the coach would know that yeah. distinction? Yeah, he was uh, he was an interesting guy. But anyway, so he went to practice that day, and you know he looked around and he said, "Well, you know, anybody want an exchange student?" And uh, <laughs> no hands went up. But uh, my then soon to be host dad uh, was like the nicest guy in the world. Uh, he was the assistant coach, uh -huh. um, retired Delta pilot who'd come to Montana, knew nothing about soccer, just a nice guy. He he had probably not said no. Um, strongly enough so on a saturday morning he got a phone call and uh they're like well your exchange student is uh, arriving at 11 a.m you know please <laughs> pick him up at the airport and they they had not signed up for that um but they took me in regardless so sure. i get to live on a on a ranch in hamilton um with a mormon family which was a wonderful experience for me uh -huh. um four siblings cows horses dogs it's a whole entirely new world for you and I just fell in love with Montana. Yeah. So then when I got out, um, or when I graduated high school, I was 17. And it was like, well, I can go back to Germany. Three more years of really hard school. Uh -huh. And then a year of military service. Um, and or I can try to go to college here. And I ended up figuring out how to go to the University of Montana. Nice. And just loved it. Yeah. And so you graduated, what, 2000? Was that? 2002. 2002. Yeah, okay. I went here in 98 through 2002, lived on campus the whole time. Uh -huh. I couldn't take out student loans, so I had to, A, work a lot in the summer. And while I was here, I uh, um, 
you know, I was a custodian of Aber Hall. Okay. I cleaned all those bathrooms every every Saturday and Sunday morning, starting at 5 a.m. and and I became an RA at some point, which was much more pleasant um, than being a custodian. And then I uh, ultimately, you know, became the assistant head resident of the Girl Storm. <laughs> I think I was the last male to be the assistant head yeah, resident. Yeah, he's Girl got Storm. a way of carving out uh, choice gigs. It yeah. Seems. Yeah, and I did that, and you know, graduated two thousand two, and um, degree in marketing, Spanish, and then went out and yeah, started so, my career. Yeah, so you've worked in a variety of agencies. I know you've L.A., Portland, Seattle, a bunch of different marketing roles. Um, give us the highlights there. Like, how did you? What was kind of your the cure? How did you curate your career decisions as as a young sort of guy new to the marketing scene? Yeah, so I. You know, when I first graduated, I actually had a job in an ad agency here in Missoula. Okay. And uh, and it was it was a good job. It, it was a real job. It was a it was a paid job, and um, my mom was really proud. And uh, I uh, my boss, however, left, mm. and he was the president of the ad agency, and he was really my mentor there. And I recognized fairly quickly after his departure that a I wasn't very good at what I was at my job. Yep. Um, and B, now I wasn't getting any better. Okay. Um, so I quit and thought about becoming a personal trainer. You know, I had all kinds of like, you know, sort of weird like conversations with myself about what I should be doing with my life, which at this point my mom is very freaked out because <laughs> yeah. her son just graduated college and he has a job for like two months and then yeah, he quits. And then it and, disappears. Um, but uh, ultimately I decided that I had six months left on my work permit, um, so I just wanted the best experience possible. Uh-huh. Uh, and I recognized that at the time I probably couldn't have that experience in Missoula. Um, Seattle was the only place where I knew a person sure. um, who I had met through a friend who needed help with a business plan. So in return for me writing a business plan, which I never finished, um, she let me stay uh, in her apartment, um, actually in her room on the floor. And her daughter was also living in that room. Oh, wow. So it was, uh, um, it was quite the adventure. And I moved out to Seattle, and I, I basically just had the goal to to work for the best company possible, but more importantly, the best person possible. Mm. Another so mentor-type figure. Yeah. So I I cold-called companies and tried to get meetings with so like CEOs and presidents. Yeah. And I did that with an ad agency called Wong Duty. Yep. Um, yep. And they, uh, you know, and, and I mean, initially Pat Duty kind of laughed at me a little bit. Um, and but your approach is it's novel in yeah, a way. Yeah. And I said, hey, I'll work for free. Yeah. Uh, I just want to learn. And at the time, 2002, this is right after the dot com boom. So I guess it's a dot com bust now. The agency wasn't doing very well. They were laying people off. And Pat said to me, it's like, listen, man, I can't. Even if you're working for free, I can't, I can't be hiring you. It's gonna look bad, you yeah. know, if I bring in the free intern here. And uh, but then, you know, Pat was a pretty frugal guy, or is a pretty frugal guy. So one Saturday morning, he called and he said, "You know what? Like, come in, start on Monday, but bring your own laptop." And <laughs> my office—I didn't have an office, but I was literally like in the broom closet next to the CEO's office, to yeah. Pat's office, and um, and I learned so much. Absolutely. So I worked for free for like three months, um, and then they actually offered me a job and moved me to Los Angeles. Uh huh. Spent three years there. Um, didn't really ever love Los Angeles. It's, it's, it's a very big city. You know, mm-hmm. I come from a small town in Germany, twenty five thousand people. L A. I don't know, fourteen million. Yeah, people. giant change from Seattle. Yeah, it's very scary. Um, yeah. It's very scary for me. And uh, but I. Um, I ultimately, at, at some point, came up to join the advisory board here at the business school. Uh-huh. We and asked you back. Yeah, yeah, which was awesome. And I got to, you know, speak to students and just just, just always loved this place. And um, afterwards, this guy walks up to me, who's also on the advisory board, and he said, hey, man, I, uh, um, I, you know, could you imagine, like, coming to work for me in Portland? That's Tim. Yeah, that's Tim O'Leary. Okay. Yeah, I'm CEO of r c Group at the time. And we've had um, uh, Tim's partner, yeah, Michelle, Michelle, on Cardinal. the pod as well yeah. a, few, a few months ago. Yeah, a good friend of mine and uh, wonderful people. At first, I thought he was joking. And 
I was like, oh, yeah, that's funny. Ha ha. Um, he's like, well, let's let's have dinner. And I'm like, well, I'm flying back tonight. And he's like, well, why don't I come, why don't I come <laughs> why don't down I on Monday? Why don't I fly you back? Yeah. Myself? Um, so no, Tim flew down to yeah. Santa Monica to have dinner with me that Monday. And then over the next three or four months, we, you know, we talked a lot about what my role could be. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and then I ultimately moved to Portland to be in charge of uh, digital strategy at uh, um, an ad agency called R2C Group, which is the largest um, independent direct agency in the country. Um, and then, and Wong Duty is, is probably the most celebrated small creative sure. uh, ad agency in the country. So I had a really good, you know, sort of balance there. Um, yeah, and Wong Duty seems to punch above its sort of weight class in terms of brand recognition and just the prestige that the agency has in the industry. Yeah, and wonderful place too. Both places, just great people. And, and you know, one of the things I was always fortunate when I worked on Wong Duty, so listen to this, so that it's Pat Duty, uh, Irish guy. Um, it's Tracy Wong, Chinese creative guy, sort of a legend. Yeah. And the CEO's name is Ben Wiener. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and then That's for, fraught. Yeah. So, uh, he didn't get his name in the company, even though for a while, <laughs> this is not a joke, the fourth partner's name for a while was a guy named Court Crandall, who actually wrote the movie Old School. Um, so for a while, we were called uh, Wong Duty, Crandall Wiener. But um, but then at some point, they're like, when Court left, it's like, let's just go back to Wong Duty. It's bad enough. But I think the name <laughs> helps. Yeah. Or hurts. It, <laughs> one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, kind of... Um, departing from the bio, but um, I'm kind of interested in, in these. I mean, you're in marketing, digital marketing. Well, kind of at a time when digital marketing as a thing, as a practice, as a craft is emerging. Yeah. Like, what are you seeing in terms of not just industry trends, but personally, are you thinking, okay, we're how, you know, how are you making judgments about opportunity and what skills you need to um, invest in personally in order to, you know be at the forefront of creating more opportunity for yourself? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, again, I'm the kid who didn't have internet or an email yeah. address in like 97. So I, I was not, I would not call myself a technologist in any way or shape. But, um, you know, the way I got into digital is that I had a blog that I'd started when I graduated um, that I just, you know, at the time it was called the Mario blog. Now mm-hmm. it's just Mario.to. And uh, um, and I'd been writing every day, uh, you know, on this little blog. And um, I don't think anybody was reading it. My mom was reading it probably. Sure. She was like printing them out as my mom will do, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, one day I was in a meeting and with a client of mine, Bosley, the hair restoration people. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was looking at the website traffic of one of our landing pages. And I thought it was ridiculous that this website that had like thousands of dollars worth of like advertising going towards it had less traffic than my stupid little blog. Interesting. Um, So I I said to them, it's like, we should start a blog. And uh, they're like, what's a blog? This is the early days. Nobody, nobody's blogging. And, uh, and I explained it to them and they're like, Seems like an okay idea. And, sure, um, whatever you say, kid. Yeah, what I, what I wanted to do at, at the time, it's like we're doing testimonials and infomercials. And, and I just didn't believe that people just wanted to see those things on television. I always felt like people would go and do their own research and then they, they'd go to Google and that's where we needed to be. Yeah. So we started a blog called battleagainstbalt.com. Yeah. And we took one of my coworkers, and at this point I would qualify for this too. He had a little bit like less hair than I did at the time. And uh, um, we actually <laughs> brought him up to Seattle and went through a hair restoration surgery. And I documented the entire journey. With Bosley? The word With I mean, Bosley. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I actually passed out in the surgery room as he was, you know, like as I was trying to film his surgery. and I, <laughs> Too intense. I, yeah, I'd, I'd never seen blood, turns out. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, so I, long, uh, long story to, to, to the point I'm trying to make, which is... I think you need a project. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the internet technology, um, everything is constantly changing and it's changing really, really rapidly. Um, 
where you can't just do stuff for clients. You can't just read books. I think the best way to learn and, and sort of stay on the cutting edge is to, to have a side project um, and to be able to like noodle around with that and, you know, try different things yeah. and see what works and see what doesn't work and take risks and then sort of iterate from there. Um, so if somebody's interested in technology, online marketing, the thing I would say is like start something. Yeah. Start a podcast. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Start a blog. Uh, start a start a website. Start a YouTube channel. It doesn't really matter what. I mean, it should, it should, like match up with your passions. Sure. But I think that's the way to to do and to do it, and then to just learn. Yeah, learn by doing. Get your hands dirty. Kind of play around. And and a lot of I mean, the whole predator to prey model of, in marketing has totally been switched. And like with a podcast, with a blog, whatever, like. You might have some notion of who your audience is when you get started, your mom, for example. Yeah. But like it's kind of surprising to me. Like we'll put out content with this podcast and it's I learn more about the like the audience kind of reveals itself yeah. to the product. And it's really kind of interesting in, in, in the way you learn from what your audience is telling you. Well, it, it used to be, I mean, the, the sort of big development to me is that, you know, you used to have the media yeah. and uh, and as advertisers, as marketers, you know, we would we would lease access to the audience of the media. Mm -hmm. and we'd buy ads or do whatever, right? Television commercials, banner ads. Um, now you can be the media, right? Like now you can build your own channel yeah. and your own audience. And if you do that, then you don't really need to advertise in other, you know, um, people's channels anymore. You don't, I mean, that's why the media is kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. um, digital media is not at this point because there's a lot of money that's going to go over there. But more and more, I think brands are saying, why not create our own content? Yeah. I mean, I think Red Bull, they were really the first to Yeah, to I mean, they're certainly that. ahead of the game there. And, and, you know, it's unclear if they're a beverage company or a content company. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think they're just about experiences. Yeah. And they document them. And then, you know, you, t you, you sort of layer on all these other other brands that want a piece of that, lifestyle brands, and they're you know building content through their website, through their social, however, trying to capture engagement, capture attention, be have a dialogue with customers. Well, I think they recognize that um, it's better to to be authentic in that space, yeah. right? Like an ad is all about you're doing something that you enjoy, like watching a piece of content, and now I'm going to try to disrupt that, right? Um, and and what you can do nowadays is like rather than try to disrupt, it's like try to add value mm -hmm. and build an audience, right? And it's gonna, it's not gonna be like an overnight success, but it's gonna happen over time and it's gonna be much more sustainable. Yeah. Um, and and I think anybody who, whether you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to work in digital media and online marketing, it's like have a project, mm -hmm. try to build something. Yeah. Okay, I want to tell you about a really cool event coming up here at the University of Montana. Our entertainment management program will co-host the inaugural Montana Music Summit here at the University of Montana on Friday and Saturday, October 12th and 13th. This two-day conference in the Gallagher Business Building will bring together artists, entertainment executives, college students, entrepreneurs, and visionaries to present, educate, and share ideas about the evolving entertainment landscape. You got to check out this event if you have any interest in entertainment, any interest in music. Check out their website, montanamusicsummit.com, for information on the panelists, how to get tickets, and how to get involved. Check it out. This is going to be a really fun event. I'm Larry Summers, Harvard President Emeritus and former Treasury Secretary. You're listening to A New Angle. So you're doing that personally, and then you're sort of professionally starting to really achieve and arrive in, in the digital marketing space, and then you make a decision to come back here, the University of Montana, Missoula. Yeah, so I there was I went back to LA one more time. Oh, okay. So I moved to Portland for three years, and then um, and then I I was I almost took a job with a very large corporation, and at the time I I called Ben Weiner and I said, listen, Ben, I. Uh, um, I'm thinking about going to this company, and uh, and he talked me out of it. And he said, "Well, why don't 
I know you want to be an entrepreneur. Why don't you come and start your own company and we'll fund you? Mm, okay. Um, so I went back down to Los Angeles for three years and ran a company for long duty. Okay. Um, which ultimately didn't do super well. Um, it, it did okay, but it wasn't like what we had hoped it, it might be. Um, and I really burned out. I, I really, I overdid it. Yeah. Um, I was 29, 30 at the time. And, and R2C, yeah, that's a high, high performance organization yeah. too. I mean, so you were, you had, a, you were stacking up years of, of grinding pretty hard. Yeah. I was working 60, 70 hours a week, traveling, you know, being in airports three days a week. Yeah. And then I was stupid and trying to do an Ironman on the side, and just like <laughs> completely wore myself out. Um, ultimately, Wong Duty at the time, I mean, just a wonderful company, allowed me to go remote yeah. because uh, my my biological father had passed away and I wanted to, to spend some more time in Europe. And, and they said, well, as long as you can run your team, um, go to Europe and run it from there. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to Europe, um, living remote, uh, Germany, traveled around Turkey, Rome, Barcelona, and um, and uh, it turns out that our business just kept growing. I'd come back to the U.S. one week out of the month, and uh, it was it was a really fun and interesting year. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I I sort of recognized that I just wasn't satisfied. Like the thing about advertising is that you work with really cool people, and you know you get to you get to do cool stuff. You get to work on cool brands, but but there comes a time when like cool is less important. Um, when yeah. you're 25, cool is yeah, really important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like how much? Okay, you know, I've I've, I've met the rock stars. I've met the athletes. I've you know rubbed elbows with all these people, and you know. But you come home at the end of the day, yeah. and you're like, "What good did I do?" Correct. Um, and at the time, the um, so I I quit advertising. I was at the time when the university called me. I was on a 48-state road trip. I own a company called Idea Mensch, and on a whim, I decided to try, an, and I didn't try, I did it. Uh, I, I organized an event in every single state. Yeah. So I was on a four-month road trip when the university called. And we got to plant a little bit of a pin there because I want to come back to Idea Mensch and it. talk about what that is. But yeah, but when we'll the university that. called, at, at first it was to, to teach a class here. Yeah. Um, a class that was actually funded by my former boss, Tim O'Leary. So, right, you know. and you were sort of the linchpin of kind of this digital marketing, marketing analytics curriculum that we've been developing for the last five, six years, you know, and culminating with this Masters of Business Analytics program and, and whatnot. So, yeah, this, was, this move to get Mario back to campus was part of a curricular effort here in the business school, but... but the university had other designs as well. Well, yeah, and then the university, or you know, they said that hey, we we got this VP of integrated communications position, and you should apply for it. And you know, at the time, I was like, "There's no way I'm going to get that job." I mean, I'm 31 years old. Right. Um, I wear you know funny socks, baseball hats, and you know, I have never worked at a university, and um, uh, you know, or in any kind of large organization like that yeah no, and, and nor do you have any letters after your name that's a big deal in yeah, university yeah, hiring yeah. right yeah no i have yeah <laughs> I've, I've just like a bachelor's degree and which you know even though i love my bachelor's degree i got from here but um but then ultimately what it, what had happened at the time the the president decided to break that job out into two positions right hired a vp of integrated communications and then hired me to run marketing mm -hmm. for the university um yeah and you picked a difficult five years to run marketing for the University of Montana. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, I did. It, it, uh, it, was a, it, it was a challenging but very fun time. Yeah. Um, so you know, just to be clear for listeners, Mario wrapped his tenure just this past December, December 17, and uh, we'll get on to what he's been doing next. But yeah, let's talk about this five-year stint as, um, as running marketing for yeah. the University of Montana at a time where people have a lot of ideas about how marketing should be done here. Yeah, you're getting told a lot of different things, and there's a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I would have, I would presume. Yeah, and ultimately, I mean, I, you know, I ran integrated communications for two years, so I was a chief marketing officer, and um, but I also, you know, I ran public radio and yeah. printing and graphics and alumni, and um, and that was just such a gratifying experience um, to you know to be able to interact with with departments like that because sure. that's not uh, what my background. 
is at all. Um, I, I mean, I would say marketing the university, university is, um, you know, the university is not a big advertiser. The university is not able to um, spend their way out of a crisis necessarily. Um, my take, and it's not, it's not necessarily a popular take, has always been that it is actually not about promotion. Mm -hmm. Like we do not need to promote ourselves more. Um, I mean, we we might, right? And if we have a product um, or an academic offering that's that's really you know very hot, then we should promote it. But but ultimately, my belief has always been that we need to. Um, and I still say we because I, I, I truly love this this place. Yeah. And I um, have many great friends here. And, um, and I, I know the university is going to do do great again, but but it's ultimately about our product. Um, so in marketing, there's a four P's, right? There's a, the product, like what it is that you offer. There is a, the price, um, uh, how much you charge for it. There's a place where you mm -hmm. sell it through, and then there is promotion. And when people think of marketing, they oftentimes just think of promotion. Yeah, they overweight the promotion. Um, yeah, the reality is that we might have a little bit of a product issue. And, um, and that's really where the opportunity is at, right? Uh, people aren't going to Montana State University because they love their ads. People aren't that shallow. People are going to, you know, Montana State University because, you know, I want to be an engineer and that's a great place to go and get an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the product offering, right? And Bozeman is a cool place, just like Missoula. And, and the price for an engineering degree, even from out of state, is 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 it's pretty it's very appealing, right? Yeah. So the promotion doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that you have product market fit, that you have an academic um, offering that that is in demand, that people want to study. And nowadays, that's quite the economic decision because when you come from out of state and you spend twenty five thousand dollars a year to go to the University of Montana, well, you know, you, you're gonna want a certain outcome coming out of that. Um, and, and you're gonna need that because otherwise it's a really bad decision. Yeah, you um, gotta pay it off. So I've always been of the belief that uh, to, to address the enrollment challenges at the university isn't about sending out more catalogs um, or buying more ads on television. It's about looking at what we offer and finding better and smarter ways to offer it. Mm -hmm. um, that can mean not offering certain things. Um, it can also mean, you know, think about the place. Uh, it can mean bringing a program online. Um, it can mean reducing the price. It can mean increasing the price. To me, those are the levers that we need to address. Unfortunately, those are the hardest levers to address. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like what you're talking about are questions of, of broad strategy at the university level. And I think we're, we're sort of in the midst of trying to figure out what the strategy that the president and his team have put forth is, is going to be, like what shape it's going to take. And yeah, what product, what, what, what our conception of product will end up looking like. Yeah, and who, who is our consumer? Right. right, and I, I see. I use the word consumer, and then people get all up in arms. I know it's a little fraud to think yeah, of the student as the customer. Uh, uh, You're in a safe space that's to do right, that, Mario. They're students, um, but but here was always my pitch. So I think in Montana, every year there are ten thousand high school graduates. I think five thousand end up going to college, um, and then out of those five thousand, I think fifteen hundred are going to go to out of state. So you have 3,500 like yeah. fresh students coming out of Montana high schools um, every year that are going to go to college in the state of Montana. I think we have 23 campuses if you count like tribal colleges. Yeah, that's so you have, you have 23 <laughs> colleges. These numbers don't add up. 23 colleges trying to go after you know 3,500 like high schoolers. Um, on, the, on, on, on the flip side, I think in the state of Montana. There are 130,000 people who at some point um, enrolled at a state institution, but then never, never graduated. Mm -hmm. um, so they're still but they're still living in the state. Right. Um, but they never degreed. Yeah, uh, class or two or three or a year or whatever. Yeah, and that could be, 
you know, that could be the, the single mom in eastern Montana working in a grocery store. And, you know, she had two years of college, didn't finish. And now she's, I don't want to say she's kind of stuck, but, um, but there is no, no campus in her community. Yeah. I have always felt like if you really want to address the enrollment issue, you have to really look outside of those 3,500 kids coming out of high schools um, every year. And you need to, you need to look at a different target market and then come up with a different, um, or, or you need to evolve your existing academic offering to maybe make it um, work for them a little bit. And that's probably having a lower price and bringing that education online. So that single mom can like stay in Eastern Montana in a small town, stay employed in her job, mm -hmm. take care of her children and finish her degree. So yeah. she ultimately has better opportunities available to her. Yeah, rethinking the sort of structural constraints and assumptions with which we operate here. I mean, that's at the heart of it. And you know what? I, you know, during those five years, I, I fought a lot of good battles. Oh, yeah, for sure. I made some good, you know, pitches. And I think I, I, I helped bring the university online from just a communications perspective. Uh -huh. You know, if you look at our website and our social media and, um, you know, I oversaw licensing. So I got to work on you know, the, the Big Dipper ice cream and the Grizz Lager. And I think yep. we did a lot of really cool, cool stuff. cool, innovative projects. And, and we got to kind of emphasize that Mario wasn't, uh, I mean, you weren't really competing on a level playing field with your competitors budget-wise. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, I, we don't need to get into the weeds of that. But, but yeah, I mean, you had to be, you had to be a little bit gorilla. Well, but, but here's the thing, too. It's like, I mean, if you look at, you know, this is where the university needs to, you know, deserve a lot of credit. Um if you look at the total enrollment budget that my guess Montana State spends, and you look at the number of students that Mon Montana State brings in, and then you compare that to the enrollment budget or marketing <laughs> budget that the University of Montana has, um, and the number of students that the University of Montana brings in, my guess is the university is actually much more efficient at yeah. bringing in new students. Um, you know, that, that cost per enrolled student is probably much lower than um, than what MSU might spend. Uh, yeah, you got to be careful with those ratios, though, right? Well, and the, <laughs> but the danger is like if you don't if you don't have the resources, you know, to throw more money against it, then it does you no good. Right. But right. but I think this university has always actually done a great job with the resources available mm -hmm. to it in attracting students. I just think in the long long term, it's not about promotion. It's yeah. about the academic program that we offer and how we offer it. Mm -hmm. And this comes from someone who, you know, I worked on Borders bookstores and I worked on blockbusters. So I've seen categories um, that that didn't necessarily evolve um, with the times. And I've always been afraid that there is that risk for us here. Um, because you know what? Barnes & Noble or Amazon didn't outspend Barnes & Noble when it came to advertising. Right. Um, Netflix didn't spend more money than Blockbuster did when it came to advertising. Uh, so it's, it's not about budget to me. It's ultimately about a willingness to, to really have a product or an academic offering that, that fits the times and that mm. does what it needs for our consumer. So you looked at your time here from the start. At least you've told me that it, you know, as a five-year kind of commitment yeah. to come back to, to, to... I promised that to Tim O'Leary when I took the job. Yeah, to chip into university, to, to try to crack this nut of our, of our struggle and advance the ball in the way you could. And so now you've moved on and are doing some new things. You're, you're working with Genius Link and working remotely here from, from Missoula. Uh, tell us about that transition. Tell us about this Genius Link project and, and what it's all about. I know you started, you've been on the board for a long time and been involved with this group since its inception. Yeah. What are they all about? Um, yeah, so when I graduated, I had a, oh, when I graduated, when I, uh, um, when I left the university, <laughs> I had a, um, Just being on campus brings you back. Yeah, I had a few different opportunities. Um, but ultimately, I decided that, A, I wanted to stay in Missoula, and, uh, or at least mostly. I'm probably in Missoula nine months out of the year. Um, and B, that I, I wanted to work for a smaller organization where I didn't quite 
have as many bureaucratic hurdles. Um, yeah. So I can actually do the work. I like doing the work. I'm not a good person to send to committees. I get I get bored. I have you know attention deficit disorder. I'm on my phone. I'm you know doing this, doing that. Um, but I actually like doing the work. Mm -hmm. So um, so I became the CMO of a company, Seattle startup called Genius Link, which sort of was started maybe in the business plan competition here yeah. um, in like 2000. You know, that's maybe when the, the, the kernel of the idea started. A couple was, of your buddies from undergrad. Yeah, from undergrad and high school. The, the oh, first, really? So the, the Hamilton guys. The first two guys I met uh, when I uh, – um, my first two friends. And, you know, one of them went to Apple for a while. The other one went to Microsoft for a while. I went into advertising and then the university. And, uh, um, you know, ultimately they uh, – uh, came back together and they started um, what's called an intelligent link management tool. Okay, um, you're going to so have to define that for all of us. So it's it's basically a link shortener yeah. that is really smart. Um, and it, it's all tied to global commerce. So we work with the likes of, you know, Amazon and Apple, but also, you know, YouTubers creating content like out of their garages. But like in a nutshell – you know, with global commerce, global e-commerce booming, um, it's the, 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 the world has become more global, but like the link technology necessarily hasn't. So I'll give you the example that I think is like the simplest example. Um, so if I were to send my mom a, a, an Amazon link, a product I find on Amazon that I think she might enjoy. Sure. Um, if I send her that link on, you know, Amazon.com, what is she going to do with that? She lives in Germany. She can't buy it from Amazon.com. So what um, Genius Link does is we translate that link and send my mom to that same product on Amazon Germany. Mm. Um, so, you know, my mom has a better experience because she gets to the right product without yep. frustration. Um, Amazon makes more money. Because now we've we've solved what we call the issue of geo fragmentation, and and anyone evolved in that ecosystem, like an affiliate or somebody you know promoting Amazon products, apps in the um, app store on yep. iTunes, music, videos, um, they're gonna earn more commissions. Sure. Because now they're they're getting to like capture that international traffic, that international commerce, and that's the problem that we solve. Nice. Um, so it's a it's a startup. It's it's probably twelve of us. Okay. Um, I would say a third of us were remote. Um, headquarters is in Seattle, mm -hmm. but um, you know the the two founders have been best friends since they're five years old, and it's kind of a family run startup. I just absolutely love it. Yeah, and you've been on the board for a while, so like, I mean, your relationship with these guys goes back, but also your involvement with the company. So you're coming into some somewhat of a familiar situation. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I knew what, what needed to be done. And, right. Um, and that offer had been there for years. Um, they they basically said, when you're ready to, you know, come work for us, yeah, yeah. like, you know, it's that job is here for you. Um, so it was just it was just perfect timing for me. And, uh, um, and you're able to stay here in Missoula? Yeah. Yeah. I'm here in Missoula probably I, – I, I always – I call myself uh, – and my girlfriend, who's also somewhat nomadic, but um, we both get to work remote. So I, you know, I, I always say we're digital nomads with yeah. a house. Um, so we probably spent nine months here. I probably spent, well, maybe we spent eight months in Missoula. I probably spent a month total in Seattle and then three months in, you know, Europe or Mexico. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're about to go to France for a month. So I'm really excited to, um, you know. That sounds like a really rough life, Mario. Well, it's it's I, I don't think it's for everyone. Sure. Um, and I, I I even think for my girlfriend it's harder than for me because I'm, I'm actually kind of an introvert and uh -huh. she's definitely an extrovert. So she you know needs people needs around community. her. And like um, whereas you know I'm perfectly fine being holed up in my office all day with my headphones with on. With your cat. And, yeah, my cat, and <laughs> you know jamming away on a project. So so I absolutely love the life, but um, but I could see how it's challenging and it does force you to. Um, to to want to go outside, yeah. um, like you should, you know, when you're done with work, you should go out and have a beer with people, uh, meet people for coffee, because otherwise it it can be a somewhat isolating experience. 
But I'm complaining at a very high level here. It's a wonderful life. Yeah, these these are sort of what is that pithy statement? First world problems. That's right. Absolute first world problems. Yeah. Even that statement is sort of obnoxiously first world. You yes. Know, sort of. Anyway, um, but yeah, you know, as we as we kind of wind this thing down, Mario, let's talk a little bit about that outside of work. I mean, you're a avid uh, endurance athlete, cyclist, mountain athlete, um, and I know that the, you have this project idea mensch um, mm-hmm. that I'd love to learn more about. I still don't really know what it's all about, yeah. so let's talk about both those things. So, what any adventures on the calendar this summer before you leave for France? No, last year I, I walked the uh, John Muir Trail. Yeah, that was a big know, one last September, I, right? Yeah, and you know, you are an athlete. I'm more like a hobbyist. Oh, um, come on now! But uh, you yeah, see this no, guy on the soccer field, you'll change your attitude. <laughs> no, no big adventures. We're going to France for months. My sister lives in Paris. Okay, and she's getting married, so um, I'm excited about that. Um, for sure, just. I love the French food and I love French culture and the people. I just think it's it's a wonderful place and it'll be a um, it'll be nice. I'll hopefully run a lot and stay active because otherwise all that baguette and cheese is gonna um, put some pounds on me. But no, Idea Mensch is a site project that I started a decade ago. Yeah, I was working in advertising and and I was kind of frustrated because we'd have all these ideas and these campaigns and they were really good ideas. I thought. But we never were able to bring them to life. And by the time we brought them to life, um, they were so compromised because there's all these different clients who had to give approval. Sure, and, you know, layers. Like then they were mediocre. And, and I, I, I always admired people who could take an idea and, and just bring it to life without all the, all the BS in there. Um, so at some point, I started emailing people I admired and just kind of asking them how they bring ideas to life. Sure. And I probably did like 20 or 30 of those emails. And um, then someone said, well, when are you going to publish this interview? Yeah, it sounds like a little like a Tim Ferriss style project. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I had just read probably, I probably read the four-hour work week, but but I had no like um, intentions of, of anything there. And um, But the, the guy said, well, when are you going to publish this? Or where are you going to publish this? And I was like, well, maybe I should publish these. And they were just they were just emails, but there, there was some interesting content in there. Um, so I registered a website called ideamensch.com. You know, at the time, I probably wanted ideapeople.com, but since that wasn't available, <laughs> like mensch is a German word for people. So sure. I thought that was clever enough. And, um, and, I, and it's got some, I mean, when you say you're a mensch, it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's not you're a person. It's like what I don't know what the sort of I think spiritual it's translation. Um, yeah, yeah, sort of you're a good person. Yeah, uh, but but then you're a good character. The interesting thing that happened is that I I put these emails up online and um, and then one night I had I went out to dinner with some friends and we had a couple of drinks and um, you know you get that liquid courage I think it's called and I. Uh, I decided to like email my idol, who's this author named Seth Godin. Oh yeah, um, yeah super yeah. famous marketing and author. That, yeah. yeah, and and I emailed. And I actually did his Alt MBA a couple of years ago, so I've gotten to interact with him a bit more. But I emailed him that night, and I I tried to get him to do an interview with me. Um, and then I woke up in the morning, and I was like, "Oh my gosh! Like, what did I do last night?" You know? <laughs> and I log into my email, and not only had Seth Godin written back. He had gone on the website, downloaded the questions, and answered them, and emailed those back Voluntarily, to me. Yes. without an ask. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I was kind of awkwardly asking sure, him probably yeah, in my yeah. email, but without, like, actually getting to the point. But um, but what an endorsement of what you're doing. Yeah, and since then, I've done over 3,500 interviews with entrepreneurs, and yeah. it's, all, it's, it's, it's the largest interview platform on the internet, and it's all crowdsourced. So people up, download the questions and upload the answers. Um, I've got two employees who sort of manage that um, that workflow, and it's been like, it's been an absolutely wonderful project to have. And, and honestly, at this point, Justin, I don't, I don't think it'll ever go away. Why? Why would um, it? It's uh, you know to make some money. Um, yeah. it's, I probably have seventy five thousand monthly readers at this point, sure. which. You know, English is not my first language. I don't have to produce any of that content. It's pretty remarkable that I get to I get to do that and I get to be in the middle of it. And just like you with your podcast, if I want to get to know someone, 
I can just email them and ask them to do an interview. It's a great license to talk to interesting people. That's right. I feel like there's several layers of irony here, so that probably means we should uh, we should close before we start making bad jokes. Yeah, let's do it. Mario, this is awesome. I love your work, your spirit, and you're just your unique create uh, unique take on how to create opportunity and see it. So thanks for coming on the pod and sharing your wisdom. Hey, thanks for having me, and keep going with this, Justin. I love this podcast. And this, this is going to be big. Just keep pushing. Keep plugging away. Thanks, All man. right, thank you. All right, hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mario. I just really respect that with the way that guy approaches his work. And um, hope we can get him back here in the classroom sometime soon to share his wisdom with all of our students. And if you get the chance to take a class with Mario, please do. Anyway, coming up next week is an exciting one. We got the chance to talk with Larry Summers. That's right, Larry Summers, former president of Harvard, former treasury secretary, former chief economist in the Obama administration. I mean, this guy just has uh, an, an amazingly illustrious career and was so honored to be able to speak to him. Um, he was kind enough to stop by the University of Montana a couple weeks ago and um, share some of his wisdom with our community, and we're honored to get a chance to speak with him. So excited to bring you Larry Summers next week. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And remember that this podcast was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're one of the largest electrical wholesale supply companies in the world with nearly 600 locations. CED is a privately owned business-to-business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment you need to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in our community, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out cedcareers.com. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few folks for making this project happen. First off, thanks to Elizabeth Willey, Communications Director here at the University of Montana College of Business. And thanks to our fabulous interns, Mason Dow and Max Gibson. I'd also like to give a special shout out to VTO for providing us with music. And finally, great thanks to my producer, Jeff Meese. As we close, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time.